I covered briefly the children's sermon with the gospel, and we go now to the book of Hebrews, continuing in the same chapter we were at last week, where I asked if you would crack open your pew Bibles to page 199, because there's a repeat you need to do with me in the text. And this is a long or oratorical string of by faith this, by faith that, by faith this, by faith that. And we picked it up, up through verse 28, and now we're picking it up again in verse 29. This is after the deliverance of, by Moses out of Egypt, after Moses himself was delivered. And now we come to verse 29. And I'm going to ask you all to start with the words, by faith. Okay, ready? By faith. The people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith. The walls of Jericho fell after they'd been encircled for seven days. By faith. Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time will fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, becoming mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received their dead by resurrection, others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised. This is talking about Jewish martyrs, Israelite martyrs. Since God had presided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, in light of the whole chapter before us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Praise be to God. Amen. A brief word about the Jeremiah scripture. This is an interesting bunch of scriptures to have in what's called ordinary time, because there wasn't an ordinary scripture in a bunch. The Jeremiah one does lift up something that is happening again, and it happens periodically in history that somebody gets a great whiz-bang new idea and they want to promote it. And you know when we talk about some things are better in sliced bread? Well, some of these folks are convinced their stuff's better than Bible. And they say, oh no, it conforms with the Bible. Yeah, if you read it their way. But in terms of an open Bible, open interpretation, no way. And it goes clear back to this time, back in the Old Testament with Jeremiah and the southern kingdom of Judah, the little struggling kingdom of Judah, there were still prophets for hire. It's kind of like when you read Dudesbury. Remember when they had the Truth Manufacturing Corporation? What truth would you like us to manufacture for you today? Well, that's what false prophets and they were notorious in the northern kingdom while well, it still lived. Matter of fact, they told off the prophet Amos, you southerner, get out of here. We're the king's prophets. We know what we're doing. And the kingdom fell. 
And what they're pointing out is, oh, oh, George, I had a dream. It was a wonderful dream of the things God could do. If only I had 20,000 shekels. Well, Harry, I had a similar dream, but in mine, God had needed me to have 30,000 shekels. Uh, this is the same old dream, people. It's called, let me tell you what you want to hear and pay me handsomely to do it. It's called sucking up to power, not speaking truth to power. Speaking truth to power is Martin Luther King, staunch American Baptist, National Baptist that he was, standing up with his Boston University PhD, and all of his pastoral experience and all of his leadership of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and saying, Mr. Johnson, Mr. President, I know you don't like me and I don't like you, but here's the truth. Vietnam's a dirty war. And I know you want me to just stay semi-safely over there with civil rights, but justice demands I say something else. This has got to get fixed. Wow, did he take a drop in the popularity ratings. And it wasn't until he was assassinated that his star came back up. If you're going to speak truth, speak truth all the time. Get people used to it. The other part of it is, why do you need special effects? Why do you need, for that matter, media? Uh, razzle dazzle? Uh, I get that some people are so accustomed to screams that for them that's normal. My problem is I get a crook in my neck. And I like a book in my hand. I'm a book person. Even though I use a Kindle a lot, I like a book. I like that the Bible is a book. I know you can get it online. What Jeremiah said to these people was, quit chasing your individual glory dreams and quit sucking up to the king who's already in enough of a bind. If he does anything, he's clobbered by the powers that be. Why are you giving him these false hopes? Why are you telling him what he wants to know? instead of what he needs to know. Speak the truth of God. Forget the dream stuff. Now we come to our great list of heroes in Hebrews 11, culminating with 12, 1 to 2. This great cloud of witnesses has a really good parallel in the American and even the Hawaiian experience in the sense that this is a long story of our faith narrative of the, as the people of Israel and now sharing that with the Gentile church of all these people that stood up and did things in God's name and some were persecuted, some were successful, but all of them were faithful. The parallel in our case is that we all have a similar kind of story. Every one of us, even the most anciently descended Hawaiians, came here from someplace else. And they had to search for that someplace else to get here. You can't get here by accident. The ocean currents won't let you. Many of us had relatives a couple generations back or more than a couple generations back who came from an old country. In my case, it's called the rolled forest. In some of your cases, it may be Yamaguchi Prefecture. It may be Hiroshima Prefecture. It may be someplace else. Some of you are from Northern Europe. Some of you are from Places in far off North Carolina, you know. But we all 
have a story of somebody having faith enough to go launch forth and do something new. Now, when you think about that, <coughs> that's fairly hard to do. I remember what it was like just growing up the just the son of a pig farmer in the 1950s and 60s. I hate to think what would have been this story if my family had been just pig farmers as they were for a thousand years. And they said, oh, your family are just pig farmers. What are you talking about? You can't go do that. Or your family are just fishermen. Or your family are just small town people. Or your family are just small farmers. Or your family are just shopkeepers. What are you talking about that you're going to take off and have an adventure? Well, sometimes it wasn't that we chose the adventure as the case of about <clears throat> three quarters of the people that founded Jamestown, Virginia. It was because you needed to get out of Dodge. You were the younger brother or the rotten cousin of somebody that wanted to export you far away. Now, we usually dress those stories up and there are plenty of good stories, but I want to illustrate to you how we polish them sometimes. Uh, I went to a church which was called Cuppy's Grove Baptist Church. It was named for George Cuppy. And we actually found Cuppy's Grove. It was a little horseshoe shaped uh, swale in the hilltop next to the river. And George Cuppy made his living stealing horses in Fort Des Moines from the US Army and hiding them for about two or three months until the heat was off, just like you take cars to the Ozarks from St. Louis and hide them south of Fort Leonard Wood in the hills. And then about three months later, he took them over to Council Bluffs and sold them, it was then called Keenstown, and sold them to passing Mormons on their way to Utah. This worked out very well. George Cuppy, kept doing that finally until the frontier closed from both the east and the west and the thing got settled. Well, I was looking up in our family history of the Waterbury family and they were founders of Fairview Township, Shelby County, Iowa, and they broke the prairie sod, which by the way was hard work because the roots were like four feet deep, and listed among the founders of the township is George Cuppy. Now, either they had a really good sense of humor or it was a case of, you know, get the cyber hacker to protect your computer because George Cuppy was the president of the Fairview County Anti-Horse Thief Association. <laughs> now, do you have relatives that have been cleaned up like that? I sort of do, but in minor ways. I don't think it's any great secret that my grandpa Christensen was a minor crook, but he was also the deacon at my home church. And uh, he was disciplined by our church twice. That's a matter of public record. Uh, both times he cheated people on seed corn. Not huge amounts, but then we didn't have huge amounts, did we? By and large, though, the story is out of either desperation in some cases, actual starvation. In a sense of mingled new opportunity that was a coming in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s. My family didn't make it here till part of my family didn't make it to the U.S. until 1870. Some of us didn't make it till 1890, 1910, 1920, 1930. But what was cooking was there was a ferment going on in the world things that had stayed the same for a thousand years since the Dark Ages. And the only changes that really happened were in the intelligentsia in the capitals. You know, the Enlightenment didn't affect everybody. Schooling didn't go that far. And so, something happened. Maybe it was an invitation to come work for a de tolerably decent wage and have a little house and bring your family. Maybe it was just a chance to buy your own land. And maybe it was just some squirrely idea that they got. 
Why, for instance, is my great-great-grandfather another pig farmer from the rolled forest? Why is his middle name Fernando? What did great-great-great-grandma read? Was there a romantic novel with Fernando the Brave? I don't know. All I know is that out in the fens and squagmires of Denmark, she read a book about some joker named Fernando, and my great-great-grandfather and my great-uncle were named that thereafter. And I always thought, that's a pretty weird name, you know. Of course, if I were Hispanic, it wouldn't be at all. At any rate, many of you have gone through similar stories. Somebody was brave enough or scared enough or hopeful enough to set sail, in our case here, literally set sail, and come across the water from a multitude of directions to get here. Now, we're not the only experience like that. Australia, New Zealand, parts of Africa, certain parts of Asia have similar kinds of stories. But what is important about the parallels with the Bible story is this. By faith, they bet on the future. By faith, they bet on the future. They came here in the belief, now pardon me, this is Nordic cynicism, that if it wasn't going to be any better, at least it couldn't be any worse. And that probably, if we worked really hard, maybe by the second or third generation, we might amount to something. And that faith in the future, that faith that God somehow held a path out there, that if we followed it, stuff would happen, is part of our faith journey. Now, the sticky part is that sometimes it's encapsulated in our relatives. And, you know, we tell the story about our relatives to other people. And then we tell the truth about our relatives to ourselves. We don't really want to have all the warts and wobbles out there in public view. But we also don't want to forget that, you know, Grandpa really was kind of a mean guy. I wished he hadn't been that way. Or, you know, it would have been nice if my great aunt had learned to cook. Because <laughs> every time we went to visit, we had to say how great it was. And man, that was a sin if ever there was one. <laughs> Okay, I have relatives that can't make pie crust. You have relatives that can't boil rice. I mean, there is nothing worse than being an upper Midwesterner and not able to make pie crust. Okay, if you can't make pie crust, you should just not cook. Forget it, okay? And I think if you can't boil rice, you're in the same boat, right? By the way, I have to tell you, I scorched the rice and saved it at a recent event. At least she told me it was okay. I thought, no, I don't want to be the Caucasian guy who can't make rice. No! You know. Anyway, all of these stories kind of get stirred together and that's really what's happening here as the writer of Hebrews records all of this, the whole history of Israel is by faith. And the whole history of our families, of our relations, good, bad, and indifferent, is what bring us to this place. It's also why, now we make the shift to the theological point, this scripture is why I don't believe we sit in the ground until the last judgment. There's two schools of thought in the New Testament. 
one of which is Jesus is coming again. Now, he's been coming again since 50 AD, but he hasn't made it yet. But he's coming again. And in the meantime, all of us will go to sleep wherever we die, in whatever shape we're in, and we will all be raised at the last judgment when Jesus comes again. Which leads to such screwy stuff as, oh my gosh, you can't do cremation because there won't be a body to be raised. Now, wait a minute. What about people who died in house fires? You know, I mean, it's just taking it and stretching it too much. God is God. God will judge. God will raise. God will enliven. I don't care if there's two specks of your great grandma left. God can make grandma live again. That's not the issue. The issue is where does the Bible stand? And it stands in two places. That Jesus is coming again, and boy, are they going to get theirs in the book of Revelation. Or there's the other one that starts with Jesus on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. And goes on to stories like this. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this is all of our Jewish history, right? Well, let me tell you, it's also all of our Christian history. It's all of our family history. Even if your family didn't start off Christian, it's still part of your history. If your family was Buddhist or Confucian or atheist. You know, I had a, I had a great grandfather on one side who was a Swedish free thinker. That means he took his Bible and he said, so much for you, preacher. I'm going out in the woods and read it myself. And that was heresy. Oh, they threw him out of the church. But he married a preacher's daughter anyway and moved to America. <laughs> That's sometimes the kinds of stories. It wasn't very neat and tidy, but they escaped and made it to the new land. What's your faith story tied up with your family? Who are the people that brought you to faith? Who are the people, whether they're biological relatives or friends or mentors, who shaped you? I have two great fathers in faith, besides my own father. One is named Tommy Thompson, and one is named Fred Young. Fred Young was the dean and Old Testament professor at my seminary and made it possible for 17 of us to major in rural church. Tommy Thompson was my first area minister in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ that welcomed me as a small town preacher when the Kansas Baptist Convention said, although Kansas has nothing but little bitty towns, right? We're sorry, small town ministry is just not important. I thought, you only got six big churches out of 200. Both of those men welcomed me at a critical point in time and helped me grow into the person who committed himself to serving in these small places for the rest of his life. Who are the people that have shaped you? Whether they're family, friends, or mentors. And when you think about it, I want you to consider this. It's sometimes really comforting to think that nobody knows what you're up to. And once I preach this sermon, you're not going to be able to think that thought again. Because instead of everybody comfy going to sleep in the ground and not knowing what you're doing, I firmly believe, <coughs> partially because I also believe in universal salvation, that all our dead relatives know what we're up to. And all your old neighbors and friends know what you're doing. Now, the good news is they're not as corruptible as they were back then. My great-grandpa's foibles are washed away. My great-aunt's cooking abilities have somehow been restored. Uh, and they look at us now not with the eyes of their old prejudices, anxieties, and hatreds, but with the eyes of the Jesus who transformed them when they got to heaven. Now, my problem, speaking somewhat <clears throat> critically as a northerner, is uh, how will I know my relatives without their imperfections? 
How will I know it's grandma if she has a good temper? How will I know my mother if she doesn't start with a critical comment? Will I be able to recognize my relatives in heaven once they're nicer than I am? It's kind of a question. But by an act of faith, I say to you that I hold at this scripture. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses while we run the race. Now, there's all sorts of encouragement coming in the next part of this book. But right now, we're following Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for sake of the joy that was before him, of bringing us all to life in Christ with God, that he endured the cross and its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So, with this cloud of witnesses all around us, let us lay aside every weight, anxiety, fear, depression, and every sin that hangs so closely. Oh, I really love you, money. Oh, possessions. Oh, sensuality. That stuff sticks to you. You gotta get it off so you can move on and run the race. And you know what your relatives are doing? Unlike what mine were back in the day. You know why Iowa small towns have little old ladies driving in cars? It's so they can lean out the window and yell at little kids. You! Get back on the sidewalk! Tuck in your shirt tail! I mean, this stuff happened! Did it happen here in Hanapepe? Did Grandma stop you on the street and say, how do you think you should look like that? Did that ever happen? Or did they wait till you got home and have called your mother so it was there when you got home? The good news is the relative who drove you the most nuts, the friend who you really wished you weren't dumb enough to make in the sixth grade and still had when you were 50, those people have all been changed by the love of Christ. Those people have all been perfected and made new and made whole. And guess what they're doing right now? They're not doing what they used to do, which is to look down and say, aha, I see you, gotcha. Now that's people's image of what God is. That's what people who aren't Christians think God does. God sits there like a policeman from on high and says, gotcha. That's not God. That's the enemy. That's the evil one. What those people are doing and what I someday will rejoice in being able to do once I figure out who all my relatives are is to cheer the rest of us on to say, go for it, do it, strive, struggle, love people that are unlovable, reach out to people that don't care, turn the world bit by bit around with God's love so that that love grows, that welcome grows. It's no accident that while some churches recoil from inclusion, churches like ours go forward to it. Because we already learned back in our own makeup and background in this congregation that the way to grow was by welcoming whoever walked in, whatever they looked like, whatever they sounded like, whatever their height or weight or income, they were welcome here. And that's the pattern of God's kingdom, of God's reign on earth, that we will be the ones who run the race and live the life of Jesus Christ for the world to see. Now, I have only one simple question. Do you believe your grandma loves you? 
you believe your grandma loves you still today actively and whatever her faults can you love her back if you can do that you can believe in the great cloud of witnesses because those folks have already found completion in the love of God and they're urging us on to keep growing in this life so they can see us thrive so they can see us whether we're young or old be successful caring loving giving people the kind of people that other people you know they said it back in the book of Acts look at those Christians see how they love one another that's our goal besides that I think the family would be proud He's 